Okay, a very good morning to you all uh, who are tuned in on our live virtual studio discussion. Um, you are most welcome on this uh, Saturday morning. Um, today I have a very interesting guest. Um, I will introduce her in about a minute or two. But I would encourage all of you to grab a cup of coffee and join us on this roller coaster. I'll be with you for the next one hour discussing things pertaining to electoral democracy. Your host today is Felix Kafuma from the Alliance for Campaign Finance, Mondaring Akfim, and uh, joined with us virtually is a lady who needs little introduction, but I'll introduce her anyway. She's an anti-corruption activist, um, and she's also the executive director of Anti-Corruption Coalition Uganda, none other than Sisi Kagaba, you're most welcome. Um, thank you very much, Felix, and uh, thank you for hosting me. Great. Um, how are we faring when it comes to fighting corruption, before even we get into the deeper things? Where are we as Uganda? Uh, well, I, I think the status quo hasn't really changed. That is, uh, if you look at some of the reports that are out there, there's the Corruption Perception Index that is always done by Transparency International. Our performance you know, slightly improved, but we're still in the same uh, ranking. But then also when you look at the Global Financial Integrity Report of um, 2017, it actually shows that as a country, we lose one billion dollars through corruption now of course a person is going to ask how does one billion dollars how is it lost we need to um expand the scope and look at issues of illicit financial flows you have to look at issues of uh, money laundering creation of offshore accounts now all those uh, lead to leakages of the system and how many tends to get out of the system and especially the country so our performance is not yet that really good despite the fact that um we have a robust legal institutional framework, but our performance is still the same old performance. I mean, the laws are in place, but enforcement and uh, improving the levels is still a challenge. Wow, wow. Steady progress indeed. Now, picking it up from there, um, we are heading into, uh, the, actually we're into middle into the election season. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, there were nominations, and very soon we shall be having campaigns and 2021 we shall be heading to the polls. Now in context, because I know for a fact that uh, when we talk about corruption and we talk about, for instance, political corruption, especially if I'm bringing it closer home, um, and then when we look at political corruption in within the context of um, the politics of Uganda and election politics per se, um, my first question is, given your background as an anti-corruption activist, um, how, what makes political corruption different from other forms of corruption? And how deep is the problem? And also, in addition to that, how is it manifesting in the electoral processes so far? We've had the NRM primaries. Um, we've had uh, pre-campaign spending during COVID. People took it to... Uh, upon themselves to uh, partly helping Ugandans, but partly politicking. So how how is political corruption manifesting of late? How different is it from other forms of corruption? Okay. Um, what we need to know that when you're talking of political corruption, it usually involves public officials or those that are in positions of power. And of course, th that means you're going to look at uh, cabinet ministers, members of parliament, you're going to look at uh, district technocrats, I mean, th that entire level. Obviously, they don't work alone. In most cases, they connive with the private sector. But when you're looking at political corruption, you're going to look at those uh, people that are holding uh, positions of power, or those that are in public offices. How deep is the problem? Um, I think for me, if one wants to appreciate how deep this problem is, you don't have to look any further. It's just a matter of looking at some of the reports that have been produced by the same government. And uh, you don't have to look very far. You have the Auditor General's reports. You have the IG reports. 
it's just a matter of looking at some of these uh, reports and you'll know that there are a lot of leakages that are within the system and hardly anything is being done. Now, what is very interesting is, especially if you read the Auditor General's reports, you're going to realize that there are issues that the Auditor General has continuously brought out, but the same issues continuously come up. Now, what does this mean? This means that um, either Auditor General's recommendations are not taken seriously, and that has led to impunity, or the problem has become so much that it is systemic. It's part and parcel of what moves or greases, or that is what makes the government move. Because you'd expect that the government would be in a position to actually um, adhere or take into recommendations its own reports. Because if this were civil society reports, then we, should, we would say, okay, fine, you know, maybe it's civil society. But these are government reports from uh, government entities and would actually expect action from them. But the fact that even uh, government itself is not respecting its own report. That actually shows you how systemic the whole issue has become. Wow, interesting. You you, you raised something I need to pick up from. You said it's uh, it moves government. Um, and, and I know for a fact that when we are discussing political corruption, it's it's basically to two ends. One is uh, it's for political preservation, to preserve a system. And I think that's where you're coming from. But also it's for... Um, personal gain, um, which are, uh, again, when you look at the personal or private gain, is that some of those proceeds somehow end up financing um, political processes. But when we talk about uh, political preservation, can you shed more light, for example, when, uh, uh, how is the political preservation sustaining a system in place mm -hmm. because of political corruption? How is this now affecting the functionality of state institutions and probably we can now talk about police we can talk about executive talk about judiciary recently we saw police um raid nup offices um under the pretext of um of uh trying to get what they called uh army fatigue um that nup had so the actions that is one of them but those actions that are seen done by state institutions how do you connect the political corruption leading mm. to or frustrating the functionality of state institutions or causing them to function in a manner that is perceived to be biased? Um, you, you see, when, when we talk of political corruption, we need, and, and that's why I say that it's one of the things that sustains the state. If you're to remove corruption, I'm sure the government would fall. The regime would be no more. So it, it, it's one of those things that is holding this government in, in power. And you see what is very ironical is that um, the 10-point program, especially point number seven, when the current government was coming to power, one of the reasons that they gave to, over, to overthrow the previous regime was because of corruption. Now, unfortunately, we've seen unprecedented levels of corruption during this era. And... Um, when we talk of political corruption, again, one of the things that comes into place, we've seen the whole issue of patronage. Now, the patronage mm -hmm. system has greatly led to, again, what we call political corruption, because one person brings on board all those people that are going to, uh, they are, you know, they're all connected, they're trying to preserve the status quo. And as a result of that, that is why you find that um, agencies that you would have expected to be free of corruption end up being end up having the vice. Now if you look at the East African bribery index reports that a Transparency International has produced for the last uh, four or five years, the two entities or agencies that people continuously point out that are eroded with corruption, that is the police and that is the judiciary. Of course another person may say that well these are the entities that people tend to go to but when you look at an agency like the judiciary, the judiciary is supposed to be a temple of justice. And remember that in Luganda, there's a saying that Omavu Tasinga Musango. It is so ironical that uh, uh, such sayings can actually even be tagged to the judiciary, and yet the judiciary is supposed to be seen as a temple of justice. Now, that's, because of that, you realize that um, 
public trust has gone down, especially whereby people feel nothing much is going to be done. Now, when you have political corruption, it does affect the levels of trust uh, when it comes to people trusting the government. Because at the end of the day, people are going to feel that nothing much is going to be done. People end up being uh, apathetic. That's why you, you, we talk of the whole issue of um, apathy. But and, and also you need to remember when you're talking about political corruption, there's a whole issue of service delivery. Uh, people getting the services. You talk to the whole issue of COVID. Now, and again, you see the COVID pandemic actually just exposed how bad the situation is. That even out of a pandemic, there are people who are willing to benefit from that at the detriment of the bigger, at the, at the detriment of other Ugandans. Now, we can't say that, you know, COVID brought corruption. No, no, no. COVID actually just further exposed how deep and rotten the system is. And, and interestingly, we saw ministers lamenting that, oh, some masks are of poor quality, we are going to investigate. The food is of poor quality. I mean, how do you have a politician actually lament about the quality of food, about the quality of masks? We would have expected action to be taken. Now, if you have a minister lamenting, and we presume that these ministers have power. So if a minister starts lamenting that, ah, the masks are of, of poor quality, quality, we are going to investigate. What are you going to investigate? Don't you know the companies? Did you give them the specifications? And again, it goes back to the patronage system. Do we lift the veil to know who is behind these uh, these poor quality products? Which companies? Who owns these companies? Because at times, some of these ministers are merely lamenting, but they know that probably the people who are you know, um, supplying these things are untouchable, so either they are connected to the status quo. And then at the end of it all, who suffers? It is ordinary Ugandans. And then the other interesting thing, again, doing the COVID pandemic is where you see the Minister of Health saying that, oh, we're going to need more money to buy masks for school children. Come on. I thought the same government had already bought masks for the entire country. So who is fooling who when it comes to issues of governance and accountability? But I think for me, some of these things that we see are merely exposing uh, what has always been there and nothing new is actually being brought up. But it is, I think, unfortunate that as a country, this is the fact that we have all these very many laws, the laws aren't working. They're either working selectively or even those who are in positions of power and not necessarily in power. And maybe the state has been captured by a few individuals who determine how the system moves. Wow, wow. You you raise a number of issues. Um, but you again uh, tickle me to now bring on board the element. You've introduced something called state capture here, or, or, or the capture. And it's difficult to, to eliminate corruption when you are discussing the concept of state state capture, um, because for political corruption to make meaning, it must, in one way or another, uh, frustrate established systems, policies, and norms, and hijack them for private use. Um, and when you talk about patronage, in this case, um, I think which is one of the key indicators. If you want to know. Um, a country that is suffering from state capture. There are about three or four things that you have you, you, you cannot um, miss to identify and partly they define the country we are in. One, you've mentioned patronage, uh, which is more of a reward system for those that are, are, are seen to, to, to support and maintain the status quo. Um, but also there's what we call co-option. Um, and we've seen this happen. Um, and now that we are in the political season, You've seen a number of people cross from one political party to another, but also you've seen that the ruling party um, continuously using resources to buy off opposition or key opposition figures. And they try to co-opt them so that they um, eliminate the functionality um, of, uh, of dissenting views or alternative views, if I may put it that way. Mm -hmm. And yet, when we are discussing democracy in this case, um, you need... Uh, those contrary views, dissenting views, uh, you must have the space to allow um, to engage at that level. So political parties must be allowed to operate and thrive. So when you do a co-option, and then you also engage into clientelism, which is very common now, and, and I think when you look at how our parliament is structured, you really see a client, a, a clientelistic parliament. Um, you are basically defining what we call state corruption, uh, sorry, state capture. 
Now, to pick it up from there, we know for a fact um, that uh, the money, the political, the proceeds from political corruption somehow end up financing electoral processes. Mm. Um, and in this case, um, let's look at the COVID resources that were um, mobilized, but also let's look at how the NRM primaries were, what transpired in the NRM primaries. Let's, let's also look at how, um, how money has continuously been influencing electoral outcomes. Picking it up from there, from your experience and perspective, how deep is the problem of state capture in Uganda? Do we have any functional institution, for instance, that you can say, okay, this one is function? And, <laughs> okay. and lastly, uh, um, on that same point, is that what is the role of citizens in this case in dealing with the problem of state capture? Because uh, probably we are looking at institutions that have been captured, so they won't give us solutions. So now, if, if, if we cannot look at the institutions that that's the idea they should be helping us, what can we do as citizens? As voters. Okay, uh, Felix, you've asked very many questions. I'm going to try and see I can answer them now. <laughs> but the first one, okay, uh, which, 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 uh, I would say there's some entities that are actually working. I, I know the passport office actually works so well. It's one of those places where you're going to go to, and the system seems to be working really. We need to give them a credit where it's credit, the way it needs to be. And then I think also the URSB. I mean, there are some of those that really actually working. Now, you talked about the whole issue of uh, opposition and being bought off. I think for me, I, I, I don't even want to blame the NRM party for buying these people off. We need to ask them, is the opposition strong enough not to be bought off? Because I don't really think that these people are under duress. They're put at gunpoint and told, we either give you the money and you come to our side. It is a decision that most of them are going to make. And it isn't surprising that even when it, in parliament, when issues of money come into play, you're going to realize that almost all of them keep quiet, especially whereby, you know, opposition and the ruling party are all going to benefit. They keep quiet. What is very interesting is when um, other policy issues come up, you know, lifting the age limit, that's why people are going to come up and make a lot of noise, but on issues whereby they're all going to benefit anything to do with money, in most cases, even the opposition will keep quiet. Now, what does that say? I think for me, it also gives you uh, uh, how, 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 how many influences politi particular political uh, people. And I know that there are those who are really strong and there are those that have stood by whichever respective political parties that they belong to. Now, again, going back to parliament, the issue that you raised, we need to ask uh, what happened when people go to parliament? Are our members of parliament representing us or at times when they go, it's about party politics. We've seen situations whereby they'll say, well, we're going to caucus. We're going to, um, the, the, the party caucus is happening. Now, this is a party position. Now, does that party position at times reflect what individuals want? Does it reflect the constituencies? Now, that is why you'll find that um, during this whole period of the party primaries, the people who have been thrown out because they actually didn't consult you know, their constituencies. They went, said, well, my people have said we should amend or should change this and this clause of the, uh, in, the, in the constitution. And when they go back to people to look for votes, they're telling them, no, 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 the things that you decided were not the things that we wanted. Of course, you've talked about the whole issue of uh, the NRM uh, primaries. Of course, we've seen a lot of money um, exchanging hands, money being given out during this election, uh, during the, the primaries. But again, it isn't surprising. Um, there's a report that was done by NDI in 2015, and it was very clear that money in politics is going to continuously keep increasing. However, maybe the issue that we need to ask ourselves is um, why do we see people dishing out a lot of money? Because one, we've realized that at times people want to by their way. Maybe they're not so sure of whether people are going to vote them in, so the only thing they need to do is to actually pay their to pay their way out. But I would expect that it has to be the other way around, whereby as citizens, there are particular people that we want to take up positions of power with or without money. And I think we need to shift 
our mindset to things that if I don't have this person represent me in parliament, I'm going to lose out. It shouldn't be that if this person gives me money, then I'm going to vote for them. It should be what I think people have to vote issues. If I lose out on a particular person going to parliament, it is me that is going to miss out. I shouldn't actually look at it in form of how much money I'm going to get out of it. But yet at the same time, we're not going to blame people because of political corruption, the levels of poverty have increased. The gap between the rich and the poor in Uganda has consistently been enlarging. So it isn't surprising, therefore, that you have politicians who are riding on people's poverty to try and buy their way into positions of office. And that is very pathetic because you are the people in power. You have failed to bridge the gap between the poor and the rich, but yet you're coming back to the same people and giving them 5,300 shillings a thousand shillings in order for you to come back and continue exploiting them so that actually shows you that you have a group of leaders that are selfish we have a group of people that are actually self-centered and so what is very interesting that i already see during the traffic jams we have this i mean we all know when it comes to road construction huge amounts of money are stolen or lost through road construction. Now, you're all in a jam, and the, the road is really narrow, but you wonder where some of our political leaders get the audacity to actually start even claiming for right of way. Literally, I mean, we're all stuck in this particular thing. It is so small. You guys were in positions of authority. You've chewed our money, and guess what? You want to push up to shove us off the road because you have right of. And interestingly, some of them don't even have right of way. But shamelessly, they have failed to use their offices to expand the roads. So instead, they want to push us off the road in order for them to pass. I mean, you just look at a group of these guys and you're really asking yourself, seriously, where are we heading to? Now, the question that you asked, what should citizens do? It's a very interesting question. And I know it's one of those questions that we, we have always been asked, what should people do? I mean, I think people have to vote. People have to vote on issues. But the, yet at the same time, you're going to ask yourself, okay, what happens if a person gives you the money? If a person is bribing, you should you say no? And it's one of, again, one of those interesting questions. Because we've had situations where you tell people, no, 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 don't eat the money. And then the person will tell you, okay, see, see, you're telling me not to eat the money, but I have seven kids. My kids have been hungry for the last three days. So are you going to give me the money that is going to feed these kids? And I mean, we're also caught in that same situation. So, But again, you see, it goes back to the whole issue of poverty. People are really in poverty. And as to whether it is a deliberate move to keep people in. Because, you see, poor people are very easy to govern at times. So people would rather say, maybe let us keep them in poverty and we just give them a little, 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 while we continuously make them dependent on us. I think for me, that is the catch-22 that we're in. I think for me, what needs to be done is still has to go back to those in positions of authority. How do they improve and narrow the gap between the rich and the poor? But yes, I think as, uh, as citizens, we need to vote on issues. I think it's high time we voted out the vouchers that have continuously stolen from us who are entitled to that even on small roads they want to shove us off the road because they think they have right of way and they actually don't have right of way yeah that's what i can say thank you cc um indeed i think um one of the things that pains you most is to be reminded that you're not a vip uh <laughs> vip uh fast and, and and they can go fast home before you can get to your place anyway yeah um yeah. that's what capitalism does um in a, in a minute or two, we'll be heading into a commercial break, but, but uh, I, I need to kind of like bring this, uh, bring in something else here, especially that uh, when you talk about voting, uh, making the right choices when we are voting, uh, we've had a chance to, in, in, uh, to have discussions with voters, um, and interestingly, um, they will tell you that they make such decisions because, one, they don't trust um, their leaders, I think that's it's because of the precedents that we've seen. When mm. people are voting into power, they go, and when they go, uh, it's, 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 it's time for them to eat until when then they have to come back and seek a re-election. But also there's another conundrum, which I would call uh, the absence of the state when it comes to service delivery. You partly touched it. Yeah. Uh, the, when it comes to public service delivery, the state is absent. Mm. But when it comes to uh, uh, querying dissenting voices, the state is very present. So you find that uh, the electorate start to transact with, with candidates because one, they don't see any other way out. When we come back from the break, I want us to 
pick it up from there and 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 now start to discuss going into 2021 um where we have now um uh, elections upon us what what should be the message what what kind of leader should a, a, a voter really look out for what kind of candidates should the voter uh be interested in um even when there is a question of money uh, but also in relation to that um how do we how do we reduce the negative influence of money in elections the what we call what we call the commercialized electoral processes so that uh we level the playing field uh let's have a break for two minutes and then we will come back and catch it up from there covid 19 lockdown has left us poor money from candidates won't make you rich do not be desperate focus on issues not money often money used in campaigns is dirty money do you know its source corruption mafia drug trafficking human trafficking theft from national budget self-seeking foreigners selfish businessmen selfish money lenders don't abandon your duty elect quality leadership not big spenders Okay, welcome back, uh, our online viewers. Um, you can join the discussion, um, send in your comments, your questions. Um, we shall be able to uh, respond and, uh, and make this discussion more enriched. Uh, before we uh, took a break, we, were, uh, we had a couple of questions that thrown to Sisi, and um, the last one being that, if I'm a voter, what questions should I ask? Um, if, I'm, if, if you're telling me not to ask for money, um, and I should vote wisely, what questions then should I ask um, anybody who is uh, presenting him or herself as the better alternative to represent me if I'm a voter? Okay. I think, uh, Felix, to answer that, let me first go back to briefly what you talked about, absence of the state, and uh, connecting it to the whole issue of money in politics. We have realized that... Um, People in most cases, or those that are in positions of authority, end up going and trying to provide services that they should not provide. Now, even during the election process, you're going to find that some leaders or those that are vying for political, particular political uh, positions are going to start promising things that they know they should not pre, uh, they should not promise now that brings in the whole issue of absence of the state at particular issues and that is not uh, or at particular levels and that's not sustainable you've seen uh political aspirants uh, donating ambulances you've seen uh, others going and uh, giving mama kits i mean they have given things that are ideally supposed to be provided by the state. Now, as long as that gap is still there, as long as the state is not failed in particular regions, you're going to have the whole issue of commercialized politics still happening. So, uh, but, but again, you see, and again, that, that is why we've always challenged members of parliament that you're the ones that appropriate the budget. So you cannot tell us that because some of them have given the reasons that as to why they increase the emoluments, because the demands from the communities are very high. And we've told them that this has been there for over a very long period of time. Each and every parliament that comes 
will always try to ensure that they increase their pay and the justification they give is that we need to provide services to the play, to the people where we are coming from but that is not the role of parliament if parliament is appropriating budgets what does budget what, what does parliament do to ensure that the monies that have been appropriated are used for their intended purposes we have different committees in parliament when reports are presented audit reports does do those particular committees ensure that recommendations are being um enforced other than continuously them thinking that they're going to take on the the, 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 the position of the state. Members of parliament or any, pers any person that is in a political position is not the state. The state has to be led to do what they're supposed to do. Now, the questions, of course, that people have to ask is, what exactly are leaders or those in political positions going to do to ensure that they improve service delivery? Because I know that every region in the country is unique. And if it is unique, it has different needs. So what we need to do is probably to work with particular citizens to ensure that we come up with our manifestos and we, we, we put our leaders to task that if we are going to vote for you, we are going to expect you to do A, B, C, D. And by saying we want to do A, B, C, D, we don't expect a member of parliament to come and say that they are going to start constructing a road. No. But we are going to expect them to use their positions, to look at the respective government papers and know that, okay, a particular road is supposed to be constructed in Masaka, where I come from. How come that road is not there? But not them themselves to come. So I think it's, it's high time that um, particular NGOs worked with particular citizens to develop key issues that they need in their areas where they are coming from to ensure that uh, they're able to follow through. And I think for me what needs to be done, there's a whole issue. Of, we need a law on campaign financing. We know that uh, our neighboring countries do have that law. And I think for me that can be a starting point of ensuring that we're trying to curb or to reduce the amount of money that is being put in politics. Because also remember, if you have a lot of money in politics, there are those who do not have the money but want to contest what happens. There are those who actually have issues. And, and you see, it doesn't mean that because a person has a lot of money, they can articulate issues. No. You're going to have people who are in parliament, they have money, but they cannot talk, they cannot articulate issues. And you may wonder how a person got to parliament. But because, well, they have their money, they bought their way, they're in parliament, they're sitting there, there's that prestige. But when you engage them one-on-one, -on -one, zero, nothing, they don't even click as to why they are there. So, if monies are regulated, I think it will be very, very important for us to get even people who can articulate. Of course, I know someone says that uh, some people use their, their position. Some of these monies are like a return on investment. Yes, I know it is a fact. That's why you see people borrowing monies. That's why you, we've also heard of stories how some members of parliament end up hiding in parliament because they do not want to pay the monies. And I mean, when you're in parliament, you're immune. You cannot be arrested. But you need to ask yourself, why should I borrow money to such an extent that I have to hide away from, from um, money, uh, money lenders? But also maybe the issue that we need to talk about Assuming we reduce the amount of money that MPs get, oh. and we said, okay, fine, you're going to get on the three million. I am sure you're going to people running away. People will actually, people will even actually lose interest in becoming members of parliament because I'm thinking three million. Nah, I would, but yeah, you see, they have all a litany of all these allowances, so guys are going to be interested. So, um, it's, it's one of the radical moves that can be done if you had a government that was willing reduce the moments of MPs. Let us okay, fine, give them four million per month, and let us see how many of them will come back and say they want to be members of parliament. Wow. Um. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you. You are basically wrapping it up saying that we should make politics less attractive. Um, I think um, politics is the second highest employer after agriculture, where most Ugandans are employed. And uh -huh. everyone, everyone is running to politics, not necessarily that he um, is called to serve, but because yeah. that's where the butter is on the bread. So um, we are now seeing all sorts of people are performing artists picking nomination forms yes. being nominated. Everybody is running to politics. Um, and I think because politics has proved that yeah. it's really pay. But in that situation where you have politics very lucrative, and it's the only sure way, actually it appears to be the shortcut to, to making wealth. Even though some people are even, uh, I know some people have also lost equally in trying to take that shortcut to, to make wealth 
when we have a highly commercialized electro process, how does this then take us into a situation where state institutions stop operating, stop being functional, stop being responsive to people's needs, uh, stop being useful to citizens because you have a very commercialized electro process hijacked by the rich, by the mafias, including those who have interests. And because of that, we end up having leaders in positions of authority who are predisposed towards making sure that they reap what they invested. Um, but beyond reaping what they invested, they make a profit. And beyond making a profit, they sustain what they are getting. So I know you've mentioned partly that a law is one way to go. Um, um, legislating on campaign financing. Of course, that can help in part. But now, how do we address the, also the moral angle of it? Because uh, there is the moral perspectives. The moral angle of the, those who are elected, but the moral angle of also those who participate in choosing their leaders. We know for sure that democracy is the only vehicle we have to change government. Um, to choose leaders, to determine what we, we should get as citizens, to have a say in how we govern our day-to-day uh, -day life. Now, when, if elections is one of the sure vehicles we can use, but we are no longer having, we are no longer trusting that vehicle, how do we now sanitize that vehicle beyond legislation? How do we make that vehicle perform? Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting question as to how we make the, 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 the vehicle perform. But I think for me, it all goes back to power of the people and uh, how we can ensure that people are capacitated to demand and to hold people accountable. We've seen situations whereby people have said no others have gone blocked off particular roads and action has been taken we've seen situations whereby people are saying you know what we're going to burn tires because you are, maybe we don't have electricity maybe this and this and this and you've actually ended up seeing action being taken i think power has to go back to the people we need to ensure that we build the capacity of course i know there's a lot of apathy people are actually tired but I think people ought to take back that power to themselves. And I know that um, this government is very aware and cautious of people. When people make particular demands, we've seen border border riders, you know, decisions are being made and then they write to state house and then the president comes in and says, okay, now I'm going to do ABCD. And it just shows that he listens to the power of the people. So I think people need to know that they have the power. It's just a matter of focusing this power onto something where we feel that we want. Of course, obviously, elections now, the way they are in, in, in the country with the various vote region, even we've seen within the, 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 um, the NIM primaries themselves, the bad situations whereby they're saying, ah, we, we, I'm going to turn as an independent because I don't trust the process. Now, if within the same party that is happening, how are we going to, how sure are we going to be that the next year's elections are going to be free and fair? And yet the current primaries of the current regime have just given us a snapshot of what exactly happened. So you're going to realize that usually elections may not necessarily be the end game. But I think for me, that continuous building of the capacity of the people to engage, because in situations whereby people have been fed up, we've seen leaders in particular areas being pushed out of the system and probably getting others. But, so I think for me, it has to be that continuous engagement and giving people hope because it is a fact people have given up people don't really think anything can change but i know something can change if we also as civil society change the strategies that we are using but also i believe that not all leaders are bad 
there are those who are really committed and have the heart to see change. How do we pick out some of those and we work with them as champions? Because there are people or their leaders that people still believe in. So I think for me, it is very important that we identify who those people are, we bring them on board, we work with them, and they're able to give that message of hope to the people. Because at the end of it all, something has to happen but again it has to happen during the legal means but it has to come from the people because i know and i believe that if people are really tired they can actually bring about change within their constituencies or even in within their respective areas where they come from okay uh let's let's briefly come back on the love campaign financing um i know um Akfim and other like many organizations have been pushing for this law uh, uh, mm -hmm on how we can one of the ways of sanitizing um, electoral processes is to have a law that looks at issues to do with disclosure um, issues to do with uh, um, putting a cap on spending um, issues to do with um, source de de declaring source of 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 campaign finance mm. uh, the money you've got for campaign financing um i need to know uh within the context of our politics, how practical is this? Are these things we're asking for? Is it possible? Is it feasible? Um, um, how, how can we contextualize those things we're talking about? Uh, the, first of all, looking at do we have the institutions? Do we have, um, do we have a citizenry that can actually put uh, candidates on their tender hooks to declare their sources? How can we make this practical and how can we make a move that people appreciate that yes i think we need to do something in legislating on money in politics by taking the path of a loan campaign financing mm. for example no I, I think for me it is very very possible it all goes back to the commitment and the will because uh we have the financial uh, intelligence uh, authority some of those entities can actually determine where people are getting the money. But also remember, you have the Electoral Commission. It is um, political parties are supposed to declare their sources of income. So we could actually start from that. But the only challenge is that even with some of those small provisions of the law that we have, are they working adequately? The issue is no. So if we really wanted to know the source of funding, I think it's very, very possible. And I think we also need to make a connection between the sources of funding and the companies that are given contracts. Because in most cases, companies are given contracts, they serve support particular people. Now, when it comes to giving services, they're going to give poor services because they know they invested in a, in a particular political person and nothing is going to be done to them. So I agree that we need to know the sources of funding and also make a connection, especially with the private sector and those that invest in politicians, but end up giving us a short work. But it is something that is very, very possible because more or less, I think government has tried to put in place uh, a legal institution. And by the way, we have the, 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 the Financial Intelligence Authority. When it comes to NGOs, they ask us where we get our money. So I'm sure the same can also be used for government, but only that at times some of these agencies work selectively, but if they really, really, really wanted to know where some of our people are getting the money, I mean, the, the, the law is in place, the mechanisms are in place, but the whole issue is whether they actually committed or they're just doing it selectively. But I, I'm sure this is something that can be done because the legal framework is there, only that of course for elections, uh, when you get a law on, um, on campaign financing, that can beef it up. But the way it is right now, I think it is still possible if they really, really wanted to know where some of these monies are coming from that politicians are using. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, when we were trying to engage on this law, it was interesting that uh, the opposition, polit the politicians in the opposition, looked at it as probably a law that would be used to victimize them in terms of um, their sources of money. Mm. And, and, and yeah, and, and I could understand partly where they were coming from because certain laws, when you make them context specific, you must uh, be very aware of the, the political environment we are in. Even when they were appreciating that, yes, we can do something about it, but they were very skeptical on how the law could be used to victimize them. And this brings us to the whole element of legislating, um, putting in place laws and also enforcing, enforcing these laws uh, within a, a regime or within um, a system that uh, many of us are agreeing that it's not moving normally. 
it's, it's not mm. it's not functioning properly uh what some of us have called it's under some sort of capture so how do we then liberate these processes of legislation uh legislative making policy making enforcement how do we liberate them from this capture that makes them known to function the way they should function because we are talking about putting in place laws we're talking about institutions that are being in place but we also the same people talking about these institutions not functioning others should function and we are again agreeing that there is a problem that some individuals have captured the functionality of these institutions how do we liberate these okay. institutions? Uh, mm. i think um the whole issue of state capture what i have to say is i i know it happens in almost each and every country uh, in the world the only thing is context and uh, how far and you know how far it happened now um when you when we, you use in one of your engagements like you say that you try to engage with um uh, opposition people and were very skeptical about the law yes that is understandable but again we need to start from somewhere maybe what needs to be done is for them to gradually appreciate where this law is going to come why this law is going to be put in place because at the end of the day we, we need buy in from each and every person and i think i would have expected actually uh, the opposition to be on board or, or, when it comes to, you know some of these laws because at the end of the day i think we need to get money from legal sources and again we need to know where some of these laws are coming from like having the financial intelligence uh, authority money on um, money law, laws on uh, money laundering there's a history internationally as to why some of these legislations have been put in place but i think um i, I mean the, the whole issue of state capture is going to go back to the will of those who are in positions of authority to ensure that they reclaim the state though of course the, the challenge has to again go back to the people because remember that if uh, the, if the particular individuals that are holding the state captive no they wouldn't want to let go of their power of their influence so you're going to need an external force and usually this external force has to be the citizens because the people who hold states captive are also trying to prevent or they're trying to protect their interests now and they will do whatever it takes in order to protect their interests but again they cannot override the power of the people if people come up and say enough is enough because remember that much as the people who are holding the state captive they also those within positions of authority that are not happy with these people that are holding the state captive so how do we even work with some of those that feel that the state should not be held captive so for me i think we are going to need you know different approaches of of um, identifying people who are within the system but they're actually also disappointed or they are disgruntled how do we work with them to give us the relevant information that we can use to antagonize the whole institution of state capture but state capture i know is something that happens um in each and every country i mean it it, it will just depend on the context and the levels but i think in our instance I mean, we even hear the same people within government raising issues of mafias the mafias are after me now if, 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 if you have a person who is in a position of power crying about the mafia how about an ordinary ugandan who doesn't even have protection at all how how i mean how deep are they actually going to lament so su such people like that i think for me are can end up being useful to give us tips or now we can try and disentangle or try and disorganize the entire uh theory of a uh, state capture thank you thank you so much uh indeed the narrative of mafias in uganda is and almost everyone is a mafia even those who think they're not mafias <laughs> <laughs> others are seeing them as mafias and and sometimes you wonder who is who is a mafia and who is not a mafia uh but uh as as we wrap it up because um our time is fast spent we have a couple of minutes left um and and i want to to kind of like now close it from this angle and bring it bring it uh towards the 2021 general elections um we know um i think it's no secret that we are going to have uh, um elections that are going to be i think the money that will be spent yeah. in our report we said um yeah an mp will not uh, let anyone who wants to contest for the position of an mp you must ensure that you've mobilized a minimum for 500 million because if we have to go spend billions in primaries 
mm. in primaries and you're spending billions. So uh, that clearly shows you how the bar has been raised. Mm. Um, now, in such a situation where you have uh, too much money uh, chasing, in fact, it is too much money chase. I don't want to say chasing too few goods, which are in this case the electorate. What? First of all, um, how do we then prepare ourselves, uh, one as a society, um, um, to address the problem that is on our hands? Uh, first of all, to mobilize citizens to participate in this process responsibly, responsibly uh, to make informed choices, but also how do we, uh, in most cases, there's a connection between too much money and violence. Mm. Um, and when there is election violence, in most cases, women do not participate. On one, it's one thing for them not to have the money to participate, but also violence locks out women. And you have a youth constituency which is charged. Um, how do we, as a society, step in to mitigate the negative effects that are most likely to come as a result of this uncontrolled spending that is already happening? No, I think for me, Felix, when it comes to the whole issue of the uncontrolled spending, it's, it's one of those things that may not really have much say over because we've continuously engaged. Even the report that you spoke about, the NDI, even your report that ACFIM has produced, these are public uh, reports that we've put out there, but those that are in positions of power, are they willing to listen? I highly doubt. And maybe the, the processes that we may need to look at are after the elections. And we raise what you'd call probably holy anger because I'm sure people would have gotten fed up. You, you see, like your report says that uh, someone is going to need like 500 million. Guess what? If I get my 500 million and I inject it and I don't go through, and especially if I suspect that the process has been reached. Now, make a connection with that. The moment I put in my 500 million, I've now become an MP. The first thing that they're going to do is they're going to increase their pay. They're going to come up with a litter of very, very many, many things that they're going to need. Now, all that has a bearing on us as, tax bear, as taxpayers. That has a bearing on service delivery. So we may need to start garnering anger based on that. Because I think we've not done a lot to do. And remember, you're going to have a very huge parliament mm -hmm. this time around. So I think for me, this is going to present an opportunity. We are going to document. We are going to come up with all these figures, how much money they are going to be asking for, and then also ensure that we start raising the anger for and how much they are actually losing out. Because I may be an MP re representing uh, Namutab, I'm coming, but look at how much I have. Look at the, the cars and all those things. Despite whatever these guys tell us that they're, they're giving the money to, to you know to the constituencies, but I think for me that will help us to start documenting and start raising the consciousness of people based on that. And I think this whole issue of um, people demanding for cities, demanding for districts, I think we also need to make a connection that the more cities you're asking for, every city or whatever, you're also having members of parliament. Now, do we make a connection? I mean, okay, there's that prestige of saying, okay, we have this city, we've created this city. But do we make a connection, even when the cities have been created, do we see an improvement of service delivery? You're going to have these re respective people that are representing these people, that, that are representing these cities. Is there a connection between me representing Masaka City and an improvement of uh, the city welfare and the people who are in that city. So I think for me, these are things that as civil society we need to talk about and document. Because with or without having all these very many cities, I think what we really need as a country is improved service delivery. So whether you have cities, whether you have constituencies, I, I know a person down in the village doesn't really care about a city. What they really want, do I have food? on my table? Are my kids going to school? Do I have medicine in the health center? So how do we make a connection with all these monies that are going to be spent, but even the monies that are going to be geared towards these politicians who are going to be representing us in all these very many um, cities, constituencies, districts that have been created? How do you make a connection with that and the service delivery? Because right now I think we may not do much, but how do we, how do we mitigate after the elections. Of course, as civil society, of course, I have to continuously speak against issues of money in politics. I have to continuously talk about election, election violence, protection of human rights. Those are things you have to continuously talk about. But you're having elections next year, nothing much is going to change. But how do we move on thereafter, basing or learning from what would have seen happen during the elections? Because there might have very many people who are disgruntled. So how do you actually bring those people on board to give you information, to give you pointers that you can actually use to engage the city? wow the golden nugget from that is that how do we 
punish yeah. the anger in the aftermath of the elections. Yeah. That's the golden nugget. Wow, we are, our time is fast spent and um, we are coming to the end of the show. Uh, Sisi, do you have any parting shots in a minute? No, my, my part in short, I think we should vote for the right issues. Those people who come to us and they're asking for us to vote for them when they have not been there and they're giving us money. Guys, just push those people out because they're actually stealing from you because they've been in parliament wherever they have been. They have not been coming. These little monies that they're giving you, they're going to recoup that when they go back in parliament and again, they're not, okay, I'm not only talking about members of parliament, but you know, across the spectrum. Let mm -hmm. us vote mm -hmm. people whom we know are going to give us um, tangible issues, not those who only come back to us when they are looking for elections. Kindly just vote them out. Don't bring them back. Shun them and kick them out. I mean, simple. Thank you, Sissi. Uh, indeed. You. Vote responsibly. Yeah. Vote the right people. And that's the first step you can make. Thank you so much for uh, being part Thank of this so conversation much. and everybody was been joining us. I've been seeing a couple of comments coming through our screen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, at this point, allow me to end the show till next Saturday, same time. Uh, see you then. God bless. I'll leave you uh, a video.